Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the Dolly Museum. We're happy to have so many people here. For those of you from Selby Gardens, welcome. We're thrilled to have you with us today. And uh, we are here for another Coffee with a Curator, an event that we do on the first Wednesday of every month. This month is actually, it is the first Wednesday, despite the fact that we've become the Dolly Island at the moment. So I'm glad you all were able to find your way in because it's been gonna get more difficult. Um, of course, we're hearing about the context of our show upstairs. Our show is Surrealism, Midnight in Paris, Surrealism at the Crossroads, 1929. So we're gonna be talking about European and Florida history from that period of time. But before we get started, I do want to thank Cafe Gala for providing refreshment. Uh, so hopefully you're all taking advantage of that. And if you're unaware of it, there is a great show down at Selby Gardens right now focusing on Salvador Dali and his environment, and they have turned their gardens into Dali World Gardens. And there's a really beautiful show of prints related to the botanicals Dali did, so that's happening right now. We want to thank the city of St. Pete who underwrite our um, conversations at the Dolly. They underwrite a lot of our uh, programs such as this one and we are definitely in their debt. Really important, of course, if you have a cell phone, please silence your cell phone. We would certainly appreciate that. We have been delighted by some of the melodies we've heard over the past few months, but uh, nevertheless, for our speakers, I request that you uh, put it on mute. Um, we do have a couple events coming up I want to make sure everybody's aware of. We're showing this Thursday, tomorrow, uh, a documentary about Alexander Calder, and he's featured in our show with two beautiful and really unusual wire sculpture um, busts. We also have, on the 26th of this month, Drag Queen Bingo. Huge success the last times that we've done it. It's going to happen again. It is a lot of fun. I invite you all to join us for that. That's on the 26th, Thursday night. On Sunday, 3.29, we have Los Dinos de Dali, probably my favorite event that we do. You drink a lot of wine. How bad can that be? It is a wonderful event, and there's still tickets available, so. Um, also, Coffee with a Curator next month is gonna be Margot Hammond, and she's gonna be talking about the actual tour of Midnight in Paris, the movie. The, the places that you saw in the movie, the people from the movie, she has gone, done some deep dives into that and also the culture of the show itself. So she's gonna be sharing insights into and behind the creation of the movie. And of course, next month we have a Magritte for our documentary on the first Thursday. Um, gonna skip that and I wanna tell you about our speakers. I also want to uh, ask if you are a member Next month, when we come for Coffee with a Curator, we're gonna be starting to scan our members and see what you're coming to, make sure that we know what you're enjoying, get some feedback from you. So if you're a member, just next month when you come to the Coffee with a Curator, just bring your membership card, and we would definitely appreciate that. So today we have, and let me turn this off, move to our first, first screen, which should be, if I work this out correctly, should be not that. Um, slide from, not slide sorter. Slide show, there we go. Okay. So we have two speakers today, and I'm going to just briefly tell you about them. A number of you are here because of our speakers and are very familiar with them. If you are not familiar with them, that's, that's Gary's. Okay. So, yes, there is an order to this, and that's really important. Florida is not where we're starting. We are going to be starting with Europe, so thank you. Slideshow from current slide. And our first speaker is gonna be Professor uh, Adrian O'Connor. He is the Associate Professor of History here at USF St. Pete, um, specializing in early modern and modern French history, the French Revolution and the origins of modern political culture. Uh, his book, his first book that's published is called In Pursuit of Politics, Education and Revolution in 18th Century France and he's currently working on his second book, Sentiment and Statecraft in Revolutionary France. So the fact that we have Paris in 1929 is very much the product of his research and history, so he will start us off with that. And then our spec second speaker is gonna be uh, Dr. Um, Professor Emeritus Gary Mormino, who many of you are familiar with. Um, his book, Immigrants on the Hill from 1986, won the Mauro, um, Mararo Prize for Outstanding Book on Italian History, 
He's written for just about everything that you read, every one of our journals here in the area, um, from the Tampa um, Tribune, St. Pete Times, Orlando Sentinel, Miami Herald. He is a specialist in research the social history of modern Florida. And in 2005, he published the book, Land of Sunshine, State of Dreams, which has been defined uh, as it will be the book by which all future studies of Florida will be measured. So you are in for a treat with our two speakers. Please join me in welcoming our first, Adrian O'Connor. Good morning. Um, and someone tell me as I try to modulate my voice with the, uh, the microphone, because I'm used to projecting. You can't hear me. OK. Um, I'm used to not having a microphone when I teach, and so I'm used to trying to project my voice. So now I'm trying to be quieter so that I'm not screaming in your ear now that I have a microphone. Um, so I'll try to project and let the microphone do what it uh, does. Um, thank you all for coming. This is, uh, is a real treat for me, um, both to come to the DALI, where I've, I've loved coming as a, a visitor, uh, and to have so many interested people as an audience, um, I guess a self-selecting group who decides to be there instead of having attendance grades as <laughs> a form of leverage, um, a sort of cudgel to get people to listen to me. All right. so. Despite the fact that what I work on primarily is 18th century France and French history more broadly, today I'm actually going to talk more about Europe, thought of uh, in general, because what's happening in 1929 in Paris and what's happening broadly in France in 1929 is much more integrated into European international diplomacy and what's happening among the European states than it is particular to Paris or to France per se. The words are on my face. Good. <laughs> then you can. I'll be an. I will be an open book to you. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> so, when we we think about the Europe being at a crossroads, or really, sort of Western society being at a crossroads between 1929 and 1932 and after, we think of of two very significant events. One is the the stock market crash of 1929. That's why these dates start. And the other then is the Great Depression. And we often learn or are often taught that the stock market crash caused the Great Depression. Right? Now, unfortunately, that's not true, even though you're often taught it. Um, there are two distinct events. There's the stock market crash of October 1929, set off by a run on stocks. It turns out markets can drop precipitously based on collective fears, in case anyone has a newspaper. <laughs> um, and separately, in late 1931, there were a series of, uh, of essentially bank bankruptcies, of bank failures, sort of like the Lehman Brothers collapse in 2008, which sets off an international banking crisis. Right. And it raises the question more broadly, and really this should be what crashed between 1929 and 1932. We start usually with the stock market. The point of my talk today is going to be that Europe is at a crossroads by 1932, because what crashes between 1929 and 1932 is the idea of Western liberal democratic capitalism. And that the crossroads that Europeans and, and so people around the globe find them at by 1932 is what to do with the graveyard of Western liberal democratic capitalism. It's not even a question at that point of saving it. It's a question of what to do with its cadaver and what to build on its grave. To understand that, we need to go back to when the First World War ended in 1918 and 1919. I'll try to get out of the way. That when the armistice is signed on the, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, bringing the conflict of the First World War to a close, Europe is left destroyed by the length of this total war. The First World War is catastrophic on a scale that nobody could have anticipated. And the rebuilding effort afterwards requires resources, both political and material and human, that are, are unfathomable to the people responsible for rebuilding in Europe, and especially in France. Right On the Western Front, most of the battle lines, and this is important, most of the battle lines are in northeastern France, right? because Germany is never conquered in World War I. Allied forces never make their way to Germany. The fighting is almost entirely in northeastern France. Right? And so that's where much of the rebuilding will have to be done. 
The German Reich, the German state has collapsed. The Kaiser has had to abdicate and has fled Germany, living in Belgium, in the wake of the war, and a new regime is formed to sign a peace treaty and admit defeat. The French have to rebuild. The English are crippled by debt by the end of the First World War. Russia has fallen, and the Soviet Union is emerging. The question is, for this rebuilding period, what will be the driving ideological and political force shaping the post-war world? And by early 1919, it is clear there are two poles, not yet in a Cold War bipolar order, but two ideological poles, two sort of available options for Europeans. I tell on the one hand, there is the promise coming from the United States with Woodrow Wilson and calls for the League of Nations and national self-determination. And on the other, there is V.I. Lenin in the Soviet Union, blaming the First World War on the imperial capitalist order that had then come back to devour itself from 1914 to 1918. And these are two very distinct ideological options available to Europe and to the world in the post-war era. One of the central questions that they're facing at Versailles and after is what to do with Germany. Right? Germany is compelled to sign Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, the, the famous war guilt clause, where they're forced to admit that they and their friends uh, essentially bear all the burden, all the responsibility of having caused this horrible war. And with that, the responsibility for footing at least a large part of the bill for rebuilding. Now again, most of the battle had been in France, which means most of the rebuilding is going to be in France. But Germany is itself recovering from the war. It lost huge numbers of millions of casualties in terms of death, and then many, many millions more in wounded. The political order is just being rebuilt. It is a new government. The very first thing this new government did was admit political defeat and accept blame for a war that just a few months earlier, the, the people of Germany had been being told was a patriotic and good and moral crusade. So a deeply unpopular Weimar government has to rebuild and pay for others. The new government in Germany faces crises from the outset, even before the Treaty of Versailles is signed. Right, you have the so-called Freikorps group, right, who are essentially demobilized soldiers who haven't been made to give their guns back, who return from the war feeling that they have been betrayed by this new government and missing the sense of camaraderie and purpose that the war had given them. And so they remobilize their military units and do things like march through the streets of Berlin serving as essentially de facto paramilitary forces. At the same time, you have the so-called Spartacists, supporters of Bolshevik revolution in Germany, people saying, let us follow the Soviet example and rise up against liberal capitalist governments and form a united sort of Soviet-style government throughout Europe. And the Weimar Republic, the new government, is so weak that the only way they can put down the Freikorps when they rise up is to rely on the Spartacists. And the only way that they can put down the Spartacists when they rise up is to rely on the Freikorps. The only thing keeping the Weimar government is in business is that these two hate each other more than they hate the Weimar government. That's about the best that can be said for the new regime. So Weimar has to, the, the new German government, has to manage somehow to simultaneously maintain order within Germany with these warring factions, and also mobilize the millions and millions, what in our terms will be billions and billions of dollars to repay foreign governments, to repay the French in particular. In attempting to do that, they run into a hyperinflation crisis in 1923. The French occupy, uh, occupy industrial regions of Germany to compel repayment, and the Weimar government feels that they have to pay the workers in those areas, even though they go on strike to protest the French occupation. And so they start printing money, and more money, and more money. And this is before deficit spending had been fully theorized. In fact, it was before deficit spending had been at all theorized. And so they're trying to back this against gold, but just printing more and more money. Right? And it devalues rapidly. In fact, the pace of devaluation is very similar to what happens to the Zimbabwean dollar 
in the mid-1990s, if you want a sense of scale. Or each of those bills, or each of those blocks, is made up of stacks of bills, and each of those bills is 100 million mark. Now, I don't know if you know, Bill Gates' kids play like that, but when I was a child, I didn't get stacks of $100 million bills go outside to the yard and play. They were legitimately worthless. Right? The bills were, they weren't worth the paper they were printed on. There is an utter collapse. Now, of course, this is not just Germany's problem. Right? This is an international problem. And for point of reference, this is when uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party first staged their, beer, their, their sort of comic beer hall putsch, trying to come to power. That's right? an, an utter failure. But this is not just their problem. Right? This, of course, is then also France's problem. Because who's going to pay for the rebuilding of the French countryside? And this is England's problem, because who's going to pay, repay for the rebuilding of England? And this is the United States' problem, because the United States has loaned billions of dollars to the French and the English. And so American businessman, and then later Vice President Charles G. Dawes, comes up with a great idea. What if American banks loaned billions of dollars to Germany? And Germany could use this to repay money to the French and the British. And the British would then repay the American banks right? at interest. Right? He was a businessman, not a philanthropist. The, <laughs> but this cycle actually worked from 1924, when it first is put in place, through the end of the 1920s. It, they, they get rid of one of the, the Reichsmark and create a Deutschmark, a new German currency that is backed by American banks, essentially, that manages to, manages to stabilize the German economy. And the German economy manages to repay the French and the British. The French and the British can stabilize their economies. And that allows them to repay American banks. It works. It works very, very well for as long as American banks are willing to lend money to Germany. Right? It works so well that Germany actually rebuilds. The late 1920s in Berlin are sort of a, a heyday of cultural life for Europeans, not just for Germans. You have, uh, you have a thriving jazz scene. You have, have one of the all-time peak cabaret scenes in, 19, in the late 1920s. This is the, the era of the Bauhaus movement, the, the sort of great architectural and, uh, and interior design movement. And you have a sort of re-emergent civil life and some bourgeois life. People have money for restaurants again, for going to concerts, for going to museums, for having fun. And Germany seems like it's thriving. They seem like they're thriving so much that they are re-welcomed into the community of nations. In 1926, Germany joins the League of Nations. And in 1928, European diplomacy seems so sort of cooperative, that the European power signed what's called the Kellogg-Briand Pact, arranged by the American Secretary of State and the French, essentially, Secretary of State, Aristide Briand, in 1928. And this treaty outlawed war as a mode of political statecraft. Now, it's often laughed off and said, you know, well, how well did that work? Well, it's also a nice sentiment, though, that states would try to not destroy each other, right? especially in the wake of the First World War, right? that these states are anxious about the prospect of war, but hopeful about the prospect of international cooperation. Right? And they're trying to give some teeth to international diplomacy in the wake of the First World War. Right? So by 1928, and Germany is a signatory to this as well, by 1928, European nations who had so recently destroyed one another in the First World War have outlawed war, and feel confident in a sort of democratic order. And that lasts for but a moment. Because remember the Dawes Plan. What did the Dawes Plan hinge upon? The Dawes Plan hinged upon European banks being willing to lend money to Germany. And after 1929, Euro or American banks, my apologies, American banks being willing to lend money Germany. In 1929, with the first stock market crash, banks start to get spooked. But they reinvest in Europe in 1930. 
They stabilize after the stock market crash. But in 1931, there are bank failures. And those bank failures each call into question the liquidity of the next bank. And very much like the Lehman Brothers crisis of, of 2008, a run on one bank leads to a run on the next. And a run on that bank leads to a run on two more, and then four more, and then eight more. And this gets bloody fast. In the wake of this, American banks recall their loans from Germany. They say you have to repay your loan in full now. The Germans don't have the funds. The German economy seizes up because they're no longer getting influxes of cash. That means no more repayments to the French and no more repayments to the British. And that means no more repayments to American banks on the very loans they're trying to call due indirectly from the Germans. The Depression is an American crisis that becomes a European whirlpool. To get just a quick sense, and we won't get bogged down in, in numbers, but a quick sense of what's happening during these years. Uh, in the United States, industrial production from 1929 to 1932 drops 46%, and then unemployment goes up 607%. In the UK, industrial production drops by a quarter, and unemployment goes up 130%. In France, down, down a quarter, over 200% increase in unemployment. And in Germany, industrial production goes down by 40%, and unemployment goes up 230% in three years. Unemployment, just overall, the peak unemployment rate was a quarter in the United States during the Great Depression. It was 20% in the United Kingdom. This expanded to the empires as well. Right? You can see this in Australia, 30%. And Germany had a 30% unemployment rate. These economies are simply in free fall during this period. You have, throughout Europe, I just chose England because the images were, were clearest, uh, but you have hunger marches, right? organize or starve. This is Trafalgar Square, a hunger march coming together, calling on Parliament to somehow solve these crises. Louisville, Kentucky, during the Great Depression. For those of you, if you can, can't see from the back on the top, it says, world's highest standard of living. There is no way like the American way. Outside a soup kitchen with hundreds, sometimes thousands of people waiting for basic sustenance. The liberal, democratic, capitalist order, there's no way like the American way, is the image to the world in 1932. At the same time, the empires that those liberal, democratic, capitalist states had built, Great Britain, France, uh, Spain, the United States, the empires are asking what's still in this relationship for them. Right? They had fought by the millions in the First World War. More than a million soldiers fight in World War I in Africa alone, leaving aside the larger imperial context of this. And so you have Mahatma Gandhi, uh, or Mohandas Gandhi, I should say, um, coming to England in 1931 to, to start negotiating what does a post-war empire look like. And the empire is obviously going to shrink and become less powerful, or at least less rooted in London. Meanwhile, back in the USSR, as the Beatles once said, you have the launching of a massive industrial project, right? a brutal industrial project, but a massive industrial project with full employment to the scale that actually the Soviets are bringing in labor from the United States and Western Europe. Laborers who cannot find employment in the United States are leaving and emigrating to the Soviet Union to find work and to find a sense of purpose. In 1928, so just before the crash in the West, you have Stalin implementing the first of his five-year plans, which he wraps up in four years. And again, we don't have to go into the, de the details, but just the iron ore production goes from 5.7 million to 12.1 million tons, and up over 200%. Right? Pig iron goes up 188%. Coal production goes up 180%. Right? This was the predecessor to when Khrushchev would later say, we will bury you. They meant bury you in industrial production because of this. The fate of Europe, or the future of Europe, seemed to be coming from the blast furnaces of the Soviet Union. 
the bulwark against the Soviet Union, against Bolshevism, was supposed to then be the radical right. Just like the only way to save Weimar seemed to, against the Spartacists was the Freikorps. The center and the center right in European states increasingly went to the radical right to try to stave off the Soviet left. This is nowhere clearer than in Germany, where in May 1928, the National Socialist Workers' Party polls at 2.6%. They're at best a fringe party. They had been illegal, but they're allowed to, legal, to form again because they're so irrelevant that who cares? After the crash, by September 1930, they're polling at 18.25%. In July 1932, they win 37% of the vote. By March 1933, Hitler has seized power after the Reichstag fire of February 1933. A meteoric rise in the illiberal and authoritarian right wing. Which leaves us a Europe divided at the crossroads. A Europe in which the liberal democratic capitalist order has failed and has collapsed. It is a dead letter in 1932. And what you're left with is the radical right of Benito Mussolini, Adolf Hitler, and after the, the Spanish Civil War by the end of the 1930s, Francisco Franco. And on the left, the Popular Front states, seeking the influence and support of the Soviet Union in order to maintain even Republican governments, as in Spain in 1936. By then, it is very much a premonition of civil war. Not just for Spain, as Dali paints in his famous painting from 1936, but for Europe as a whole. A continent-wide crisis between the radical right and the radical left, where each will devour the other. Thank you very much. the next speaker after Gary speaks, we will have a Q&A. So save your questions and we will return to it. Mm -hmm. Wow, what an interesting crowd. Uh, I've been very lucky. Uh, I retired a couple years ago after teaching almost 40 years at USF. And uh, three of the last five years I've taught in Spain at the FSU Study Abroad Center in Valencia. Anyone been? any alumna of that program. Uh, so it's quite interesting. And, and on several occasions, we took students to uh, Figueres. And, and we, were, we were having a bet prior to this. How many people, we, we're betting that probably you could get no audience in the United States of this crowd and have more who had been to Figueres. How many of you have been to Figueres, Spain? Oh my god, it looks, <laughs> it looks 20, 25. And uh, there's a, another room there. So, in 1904, Salvador Domingo Felipe Jacinto uh, Dali was born in Figueres, Spain. Uh, he would be the first to tell you, and certainly more today, that Catalonia may be geographically in Spain, but politically it's not in Spain. Catalonia is in the far right top corner there. Uh, you can see Catalonia. Um, uh, how many have been to Girona, another very artistic city? Uh, in the last decade, Catalonian separatist sentiment has just boiled over, so much so that last summer, we had to cancel a tour to Figueres. They were afraid of, of uh, student safety. That's how, how serious it got. Um, to understand Spanish history in 1931, you need to go way back. Uh, interestingly, Dali always said that uh, he thought he was, uh, uh, his family had once been Moors. Hirona uh, had a, huge Jewish and, and Moorish quarter there. So it is possible, um, if you ever go over to the Centro Asturiano in Tampa, how many have been to the Centro Asturiano? 
there's a Covadonga room. And Covadonga in Spanish history is one of those holy sites. In 722, the Moors were invading uh, northern Spain and were turned back at Covadonga. So uh, 40 years ago, I'm, I'm in Tampa, I'm interviewing a lot of Spaniards for a study on Ybor City. So I would interview them at the Centro Asturiano in the Covadonga room. And uh, they would tell me within two minutes, I, I could ask almost any question, tell me about your family in Spain. Uh, they would always, it was the same quote, you know, you know, of course, the Moors never got to Asturias. They never conquered Asturias. So this is a, a uh, big event in modern Spanish history. That's the Baths of Girona near Figueres. I believe, by the way, <laughs> those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, that is a scene from Game of Thrones. Uh, and uh, anyone who's ever been to Spain on a, uh, on a tour to uh, uh, <clears throat> Granada knows the famous line from the tour guide as Bobadil, Bobadil, the last Moorish governor of Spain in 1492 was leaving he wanted to look back one last time at the, uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights, and he sighed. There's a famous poem about this, but this is Boba Deal. And of course, the, the punchline is his mother-in-law, as Boba Deal begins crying, his mother-in-law scorns him and saying, do not weep like a woman for what you could not defend as a man. Ooh. He's, he's, in, ser he's in serious trouble. <laughs> Uh, but Catalonia, uh, Catalonia, you can see the, uh, this is recent, but it goes back hundreds of years. Uh, Catalonia was the most prosperous and progressive region in France in 1904 when Dali was born. It's still kind of the financial hub of uh, Spain. Uh, most people don't think it could make it alone, but nor could Spain make it alone without Catalonia. So. Uh, and of course, this is a famous opera house uh, theater in, in Figueres that was bombed heavily during the Spanish Civil War. And it is today the Dali Museum, yes. So Dali must have spent considerable time there. Uh, I don't think I have to add that he was a middle class, upper middle class uh, uh, background. At a time in Spain in 1904, when most Spaniards lived in, in terrible poverty, the Los Miserables, the Los Desheredados. Uh, a dandy even as a three-year-old. Uh, uh, he is also, he also came an age when Spain had sunk to its lowest point in 500 years. The beginning with Columbus in, four, it, it's an interesting story. I, for my class, I always say, 1492 in Spain, we all identify it as, of course, Columbus's voyage. But there were, you can make an argument, three more important events happened in 1492. The Inquisition, expulsion of the Jews, those are two events. And, and the third would, be, uh, third would be the first modern dictionary. And the argument there is that any nation that, that has the sense of a need for a dictionary has organizing abilities. And uh, if you talk to my colleague, Michael Francis, he will tell you Spaniards were incredible uh, record keepers, triplicates in the archives of the Indies in Sevilla and places like that. Um, but in, after the Spanish-American War in 1898, a Spanish minister said, uh, uh, the empire that began in 1492 is finished. Spain, Spain has to surrender Cuba, the, the Pearl of the Antilles, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines uh, to the United States. If, with the US, by the way, no Philippines, probably no World War II with Japan. It's interesting how these, these events have consequences later. Uh, by the way, that, that it also propelled Theodore Roosevelt to the White House. Uh, there was no charge of the Rough Riders. Only Roosevelt was on his horse. All the horses, all the horses of the cavalry was left in Tampa. Uh, 
so uh, seriously, the, uh, so it, it's amazing the, the ties between Florida, particularly Tampa, and Spain during this era. Um, the destruction of the Spanish Navy at Manila Harbor was uh, catastrophic, to say the least. Um, Dali, Dali's father was a, a, a lawyer, a notary of public, so a man of some means. He was also, like most Spanish men, a fierce anti-cleric. I got into a lot of trouble when I, when I wrote my Ybor City book. Always women, my grandmothers would be calling me and said, how could you say we weren't religious? And th there's a distinction between anti-clericalism and being religious. Anti-clericalism simply means you're, you don't trust the clergy, particularly the priest. And that's a, de definitely a Mediterranean virtue or flaw, depending on your, your values there. But there's all sorts of proverbs. I'm working on a, uh, on a novel, kind of a family-based novel. Uh, and uh, one of the characters in the novel was kicked in the head by a mule in early age. And he only speaks in proverbs. He's called Johnny, Johnny Proverb. And of course, he's the Shakespeare's fool. He's the brightest man in the village there. Um, in addition to anti-clericalism, in the 20th century, 20th century Spain, you also see a, a dramatic rise in the anarchist movement. Uh, I also got into a lot of trouble over this, but I'll show you. I'll wait for this. Uh, we often think after 9-11, has there ever been an era more fraught with fear? Yes, uh, between about 1890 and about 1915, several French politicians, the king of Italy, an Italian prime minister, several Spanish prime ministers, uh, and the president of the United States, uh, and the greatest explosion, a terrorist explosion in American history at Wall Street, uh, so uh, this was an era, and anarchism particularly took hold in places like Asturias and Galicia, where the Tampa Spaniards immigrated, but also Catalonia uh, there. And uh, we, they would discover later it's hard to have an anarchist army, to say the least. <laughs> and George Orwell writes about this in uh, homage to Catalonia there. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, the assassin in, uh, I think this is 1912. The assassin had lived in, he was a Spaniard from Ybor City. A rather ghoulish uh, photograph. Uh, so, <laughs> I get a call in 1987 on the phone, and this, I'm in the library in Tampa, and he says, did you just write this book on Ebor City? I said, yes. He said, would you turn to page 148 and read to me the second line from the bottom? And it reads, other anarchists such as Pietro Scaglione, Salvatore Lodato. He said, stop. Salvatore Lodato, Salvador for uh, uh, Spanish. Salvatore Lodato was my father. You just called my father an anarchist. And he said, are you going to be in your office a few minutes? <laughs> He said, I'm going to come by and kick your ass. <laughs> Sir, and, and he shows up. He's my age 40 years ago. And uh, we became very good friends. He introduced me to his brothers. Turned out Salvatore had been expelled from a, uh, uh, <clears throat> a religious school in, in there. And about six months later, I get a package from the Lodaro brothers, who were all World War II heroes, by the way only in America, and they had written a biography of their father called Our Father, the Anarchist. They, <laughs> they concluded he was an anarchist, but anarchism wasn't as bad as we thought. And essentially, the, the idea, and, and certainly Dali flirted, and many of the intellectuals flirted with this. The idea is that how do you explain, if, if children are brought in this world inherently good, why is society so evil? And it must be the rooted institutions of the church, the state, and the military. So it's simple. You just pull the pillars down of the church, the state, and the military. 
And one wing, the Ybor City wing, tended to be nonviolent, educational. One wing said, you do this as they did, I think, in 1891 in Madrid. You, you throw a bomb in an opera house. And terrible. Does, and, and you know what the response is going to be. The police are going to crack down. That proves the repression of society. So I mean, it's, it's a strange world. Um, Dali enters the art school in Madrid in, I think, the early 1920s. And in some ways, the, uh, let me read the, uh, the line. Here's a country that is terribly impoverished, is violent on the throes of revolution. Well, you, most of you probably know the line from the third man, the famous Orson Welles line. He reads, uh, in Italy for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and the Renaissance. Switzerland, they had brotherly love, 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did they produce? The cuckoo, the cuckoo clock. <laughs> uh, so Spain, Spain is unstable, impoverished, teetering, but in some ways it's the, gold, uh, the golden age of Spanish uh, culture. You have, this is uh, Garcia Lorca, the uh, Federico Gar Garcia uh, Lorca, probably the greatest writer in 20th century Spain. He's executed during the Spanish Civil War because he's a rebel and he's gay. Uh, you had Buñuel, uh, the filmmaker. You had Gaudí in architecture. Uh, Benito Pérez Galdós is a little earlier, but it, it is uh, Miró, of course, in, in uh, Picasso. What, what an uh, extraordinary era in Spanish culture it was. A, a painting that's uh, Miró, Picasso, and uh, Dalí. Interestingly, the, the Florida connection here, so I, I often take groups on tours of Ybor City, and this is actually in West Tampa. If you stop in West Tampa, it's in the middle of an ordinary neighborhood. You know this better than, there's at least one person who knows the answer in here. She was on the tour and got it right, by the way. Um, so we stop and, and, and I say, if you had been blindfolded and just brought to this neighborhood in West Tampa, a, a working class neighborhood, and you see this clock tower, where do, what's the architectural heritage of that? Man, it's your hour in the stage. It's, 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 um, it's, it's sp Spanish, I've, I've forgotten the, uh, the architectural school, but it's uh, Spanish Renaissance uh, and the bell tower. And, and there's a wonderful term for this in Italian. The, the name for a bell tower in Italian is campanile. And, and there's a word called campanilismo, which means bell towerness, which means nothing, except you trust only those who can hear the toll of your neighborhood bells, which is very Spanish, very, uh, very Italian there. I've always thought that someone should write a novel or a play Dali in Ybor City. So he never came to Tampa, but had he come to Florida, Ybor City would have been his place. First of all, the Spaniards in Ybor City were from northern Spain, the, the other end of Spain, but there would have been a solidarity there. They were not illiterate. You may, you may, even though they had little education, almost all the Spaniards could read and write. Most of the Sicilians were illiterate. The Cubans were also literate there. And most importantly, they respected the intellectual. They really did. And Dali would have been at home there. I've always thought this scene, which is about 1900, if everything in Ybor City had been torn down, you could have recreated the values and culture of Ybor City through this photograph. So what do you see that's striking in your, in your eyes there? 
Well, they, they, it seems to be all men, but if you look, there, there are many women in the back. Uh, and it's a large factory, a galleria. Uh, what else? Yeah, there are young, young children, which would appall us now, and, and by the way, violating the law, but uh, who cares, right? Um, mixed race. Now, we're talking about 1900 Deep South blacks and whites working together next to a white woman, by the way. Are you kidding me? This is the only place in the South this could take place because in Ybor City, these were uh, Cuban blacks, by the way, not American blacks. And the Caribbean has a different attitude towards race. So uh, Ybor City was in, in streetcars. Afro-Cubans could ride in the front of the bus in Ybor City. They'd move to the back of the bus when they left. So that's also interesting. You also see people wearing white shirts. Do you think Ford Motor Company executive, or, uh, workers on the line were wearing white shirts? They, they considered themselves artisans, artigiani. And uh, so that, that's a fabulous uh, postcard. The cigar art, uh, Dali, I would love to have ha had what Dali would have composed for a cigar label. This is a Cuba Libre. Uh, Dali would have wanted to be a reader, by the way, un lector. Uh, and you can see readers could be dandies. This is El Conde, the count, he called himself, uh, Lopez. And look at his shoes, the spats on his shoes, the hat. Uh, readers were elected, not appointed. How, I loved the play a few years ago, uh, Anna and the Tropics. Sadly, the author screwed up the relationship between reader and workers. He had the reader being paid by the boss's wife, who he was having an affair with. That can't happen because the workers pay the reader. Uh, he, he's responsible to the workers, which is why in 1931, the cigar manufacturers got rid of the readers because they thought they were fomenting revolution. This is a reader, El Lector. This is the most famous reader of them all, Manuel Aparicio, Spanish born. Uh, first of all, you had to have a voice like Adrian Connor, O'Connor, <laughs> to be heard in that. But again, look at the, uh, there's also occasionally, not so much there, but you could drink cafe con leche on the job. Uh, because you had won that in a strike, the right to come. So I, I think Dali would have just been in heaven among the tabaqueros in Ybor City. These were his people. Uh, the literature tended to be rather political. Uh, their favorite no novel, the, the workers, not the reader, not management, chose the novel to be read, one hour at a time. So. The Hunchback of Notre Dame might take a month to read. And uh, when, when Notre Dame burned last year, I immediately sent off an op-ed saying no city in America was more affected by Notre Dame than Tampa because of the love for Victor Hugo, Victor Hugo, uh, the, the novels there. His heroes were their heroes, and, and Dali's heroes, I think. The, the, uh, the, the impoverished poet, the, the idealistic artist, uh, the, the faithful and honest village priest. Even more importantly, his villains were their villains, the corrupt archbishop, the, uh, the overzealous police force, etc. cetera. So, uh, and you can imagine a Dali cigar label. I mean, would that have been the best ever? Uh, so I'm interviewing, this is scary, I'm 33 years old when I conducted this interview. In 1980, uh, I'm, I'm inter interviewing uh, Jose Vega Diaz, who, whose life compressed Ybor City. He had come as a young boy in the 1890s, had seen the American army in Tampa, had been in three revolutions, and who speaks like this? The question I asked him, it's supposed to be a neutral question. So would you tell me Ybor City's views on religion? You don't ask, so, oh, I hear 
cigar makers were very anti clerical No, tell me about religion. You know what Victor Hugo say? In every town, in every place, they have a school teacher. The school teacher is the light. And in every town, there is someone who, he goes, he's blow, try to blow away the light, the preachers. Uh, wow. I mean, he didn't ask, answer the question, but he obviously did answer the question. He would have also found fellowship and camaraderie at the Centro Asturiano. If you didn't know that building was a mutual aid society, you would have said, my God, look at that cathedral. And it was, it was a cathedral for the working classes in Ybor City. It has the most astounding theater I've, I've seen in Florida. It, it's pitch perfect. Uh, they had their own hospital. That's the Centro Español. The hospital, very progressive medical care for their members. This is another mutual aid, uh, Centro Español in West Tampa. The building still standing, all these are still standing. Uh, in the evenings, uh, you'd have people coming in for cafe, uh, brandy, uh, talking politics. I did a lot of interviews. That's the uh, cantina of the Centro Español on 7th Avenue. And what would have really pleased Dali in the 1930s, the only Spanish language theater run by the federal government. The WPA had a theater, theater project. Can you imagine that today? And, and not only that, but Spanish, and they, they performed, is it? Oh, Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here in Spanish in Ybor City. Architecture, Spanish architecture also influenced Florida, particularly in the 1920s. This is earlier, this is the Tampa Bay Hotel. You see the Moorish and Spanish architecture there. Uh, this is in Temple Terrace. Uh, you'd swear you're, you're in southern Spain. And that was the idea of, uh, that they called it Med Rev. This 1930s. Uh, Kind of interesting. I can't help. This is 1920 St. Petersburg Times, and it's telling tourists, "Hey, it, St. Petersburg used to be a town that closed its doors at nine o'clock, and but not anymore. Where in Spain, you don't eating until nine o'clock. I mean, uh, 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 things turned ugly by the end of the the boom, this Florida boom that hit." And uh, between 1920 and 26 was electric. You think of St. Petersburg, we have no Snell Isle, we had no Snell Arcade. Much of the architecture uh, is med rev. I mean, uh, the, the post office, it's hard to imagine St. Petersburg having not experienced that building boom and cultural boom from 19, uh, teens to 1926. But in 1926, you had a devastating hurricane hit Miami. And uh, Miami is the first to f experience this depression that comes three years before the national, international depression. Uh, because in 1928, you also have another devastating hurricane. This hit Palm Beach, and this is the hurricane that killed several hundred farm workers at the southern end of Lake Okeechobee. And if you've read Zora Neale Hurston's book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, that was the, the idea, is that their eyes were on the flood, or the, but their eyes were also watching God. And by 1926, the LA Times writes a eulogy for Florida. Uh, uh, stakes hid in, in weeds, the for sale signs, State dotted from end to end with town sites now gone back to scrub. 10,000 land parcels in Miami sold for tax purposes. But you also had in 1929 the opening of the Tamiami Trail in Florida. So for the first time, you could drive from Tampa to Miami nonstop. Well, not nonstop, but uh, pretty. You could drive uh, that. that. 
And to give you an idea, even though uh, the, the exhibit doesn't cover the Spanish Civil War, you, you almost have to understand. First of all, is that one of the most striking photographs you've ever seen? Those high cheekbones, what a beautiful young woman. And apparently she didn't realize she had been photographed and she, until she was an old elder, elderly woman. She does survive, by the way. Uh, no Passeran, getting back to World War I, the Bataan and Verdun, but the Spaniards say they shall not pass. That is, they will, shall not enter Madrid. And there's the famous story, General Mola, Fra Francisco Franco directs him to take Madrid with his four tank columns. And the journalist asks, which of the four columns will enter Madrid first? And he said, it's already there, the fifth column. And he met, of course, nationalist sympathizers in Madrid. There are, there are very few heroes in the Spanish Civil War. If you think the left and the Republicans, I mean, they killed, I think, 40,000 priests and nuns, 15 bishops. Uh, it, the first year I was in uh, Valencia, I did not realize what this structure was. It's an Art Deco, and it says refugio, but in Spanish, refugio. And it was a bomb shelter from the Spanish Civil War across the street from our class. And it took me a year to figure that out. And there's like a dozen of them. And you, you can see it's in Art Deco, 1930s Art Deco uh, block figures. Are these, Adrian O'Connor would have been in the International Brigade in 1936. <laughs> but are those dash, you wonder how many of those guys uh, returned. Uh, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, Americans volunteering for the war. And look at the Tampa connection here now. These are all columns culled from the Tampa newspapers. Tampa Flyer returns from war, uh, wounded and broke, soldier for loyalist Spain, fears for life if deported to Italy. Italians in Ybor City were volunteering to fight in Spain. A 13-year-old kid from Ybor City enlists in the army. They raised $150,000 in donations. I think they bought three ambulances uh, for the International Red Cross. By the way, it was fiercely Republican uh, leftist in Tampa, so much so that people in interviews told me that if you attended church on Sunday, there was someone there from the Republican cause to take your name down. That if you attended church, Catholic church, you were sympathizer with Franco. That's how s serious and insane it, it was. Three tampons killed in Spanish loyalist trenches. Uh, just a terrible, and of course, this is, a, this is the great proxy war. Soviet Union is backing the Republican cause. Germany and Italy are backing the nationalist cause. Uh, Hitler and Mussolini want to try out these new weapons. Uh, and look at that. All, all women, by the way, uh, marching in 1937. And of course, uh, Guernica, Guernica uh, is the, the, the great art masterpiece perhaps of the 20th century. And even, you know, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but you could, you could no longer get saffron, Spanish tempranillo, you can't get Spanish olive oil because of, of the war. And I believe Adrian and I are now going to take questions, if we have time. Anyone has questions? Just raise your hand. I've got a microphone. I can come to you. Questions? Any questions? <laughs> it was a. <laughs> I'm just curious. Whenever they were following uh, Vice President Dawes' program, uh, we were giving Germany all that money to pay France and Great Britain. Were we receiving any money back? Were they paying us back at all? During yeah. that period of time prior. Yes. Uh, although it came, it was essentially a 
Think of it like a money laundering operation. Um, <laughs> it went through the French and British. So essentially, the French and British were repaying German loans. Correct. Um, but yes, the United States was getting money. I know in 1920, that was a campaign issue. Warren Harding criticized Europeans for not paying their debt. I think Finland was one of the few nations to pay. Finland, I may have the wrong war, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't repay in full, but they were paid. Right. But, it, but you know, they, were, they were nowhere near having repaid. What percentage of that money did we ever really get? I mean, how much did Germany actually owe us, period? Another way of looking. They stopped during the Cold War. Both sides, the East and West Germany, said the other guys are responsible for the loans. Was that interest fair? <laughs> <laughs> Another way of looking at this: Europeans were furious. The very they, given the the millions of lives lost in Europe, the idea you're, 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 you want your money back, we want our sons back. I mean, I think we, America lost. 150,000 men and were, how many did the French lose at Verdun? Just at Verdun? Yeah. Um, well, on the first day of Verdun, uh, they lost 60,000. So, I mean, to that put things, day, one day. Two lost, uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the American interest in the <laughs> yes. states in World War One was a, a major diplomatic tension of the 1920s. Yes. Um, because every European state in some cases, more than 10% of their population. Curiously, by the way, Spain did not fight in World War I or World War II. And uh, you think of the reaper, you think of the consequences had Spain, Spain would have allied with the fascist. And they almost certainly would have taken Gibraltar from the British. The fascist controlling the entry to the Mediterranean, wow, that is, that would have been huge. But the Spain was so demoralized and crippled by the Civil War. Yes. Other yes. questions? Anyone? So follow-up question kind of with the, the cycle of like money going back to the US. Do you have any idea like why the US had thought if this cycle had been working, why they demanded then Germany to pay them? <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Could you just say something about the Germans' feeling of justification for entering World War I? Um, the Germans' feeling of, of why they were justified in World War I? Well, World War I is, it's funny, some historians describe World War I and World War II as a 30 years war, um, where because the lines are, for the exception of the Italian switching, um, they seem very similar. World War I was a failure of international diplomacy. And it was seen as a, a sort of war of states' interests. Right? But one can make a decent argument um, that this was simply power politics that went wrong. And there's a very good case to be made, I think, for the, the cognitive break between what they thought they were doing when the war starts in late July of 1914. Um, and what they're actually doing. 
And the historian Adam Hochschild had an op-ed five or six years ago um, about uh, around the time of the start of the war. When he pointed out that all the various European powers during the, the seven-year peace before World War I had been constantly fighting wars and winning them quickly because they were fighting with advanced weaponry against colonial subjects. Right? The old ditty, you know, whatever happens, uh, we fear not. What is it? Uh, whatever happens, we have, we have the maximum gun, they have not. Right? It's sort of, they, they were constantly at war in sub-Saharan Africa, they're constantly at war in, in East Asia. And so the idea that you go to war to pursue a state's interests wasn't strange. What was strange that was that all of a sudden the other side had the maximum gun too. And so they went into war, right? Everyone in the, the famous line, they expected to be home by Christmas. But it turns out war between two sides with advanced starts, with advanced sort of mechanized materiel and increasingly over time artillery is a, is a slog, not a sprint. Um, so I don't think they entered World War I. I think they entered a, a small regional war. And then pride kicked in. Right? Are you going to be the, the army that withdraws? And how do you explain after the first 100,000 deaths? Well, this was a mistake. There's an interesting consequence of this. In 1962, when John Kennedy is confronting the Soviets over the missile sites, he happens to be reading Barbara Tuckman's Guns of August. And his takeaway from Guns of August about the beginning of World War I is, if only one power had said, listen, let, let's talk this over. Do you realize how much we have to lose? But everyone was too proud to do this. And his, his takeaway also was, whatever you do, don't humiliate Khrushchev, because he will have to retaliate. If he retaliates, we retaliate. So, you know, what it, it is the first, in a war with after the Industrial Revolution on a massive scale. And one just quick point on that, I mean, one of the ways in which the states are divorced from the world, the Kaiser of Germany, yes. the Wilhelm, and the Tsar of Russia, Tsar Nicholas, they're cousins through Queen Victoria. Um, and they're writing each other letters during the lead up to the war. They're the famous, the, known as the Willie Nicky letters. Um, and they're writing these letters saying, what a shame that our countries are, are at <laughs> odds right now. Oh, I, I really wish things were better. But they have no idea the precipice they're on. And then all of a sudden it's Christmas 1914 and hundreds of thousands, millions of people are dead. And how do you explain to the populace, yeah, sorry? When you said, you know, the, the, <laughs> the Germans who had posters, go to uns, God is with us. And the French and the, the British have the exact same thing. By the way, the name of the architectural style was <laughs> Spanish Romanesque. <laughs> this is probably a good time to stop. If there are more questions, definitely please come up and ask our speakers. Hopefully this gives you a different insight into our show upstairs. Thank you both very much.